uh, one of my gunnery sergeants, Brian Jacklin, who was on the rooftop with two other Marines. Um, and then we switched out because I wanted to be able to see what was going on. So I was up there for a few minutes and then Shortly after I'd gotten up there, I was engaged by a fighter who had shot the Marine to my left and then also uh, shot me. Uh, and so the bullet went into my shoulder and lodged in my spine. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the remarkable combat story of Derek Herrera, a former Marine Special Operator who led Marines in Iraq, Haiti, the Middle East, and Afghanistan. While on a MARSOC operation in Afghanistan, he was shot and paralyzed on the objective. Derek is another one of these guys that makes me feel lazy and that he might have more time in a day than I do. Rather than give up after being injured, he medically retired from the Marine Corps and has achieved significant success while continuing to serve others. He's the president of the board of directors of the Marine Raider Foundation, chairman of the board of the MedTech Vets, founder of Habit Camera and Eurodev Medical, a keynote speaker and host of the Forward Podcast. Derek is the real deal who spends all of his time putting others ahead of himself, just like any Marine. And I know you'll enjoy his inspiring combat story as much as I did. Derek, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking some time to share your story with us. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's all mine. So I, I like to start out with people's uh, origin stories, childhood. But for you, I, I would lump you into this category as being one of these guys that I want to hate because you make me feel so damn lazy with everything you do. Um, and you know, people who've heard the intro, you've got a couple companies, you've got this nonprofit effort, you're on boards. Um, you, you've been in the, the special ops community, you know, great uh, experience there, and we'll dig into a lot of this. I think my first question, though, is, does your wife ever look at you and she's like, Derek, can we just like slow down for a week here? Or are you just always going, man? At this point, I think she knows better. So uh, she knows me better than anyone. Uh, so we've been we've been together since my senior year in high school. And so uh, longer than more, more than half our lives, we've been together dating and so and then we got married right after graduation from naval academy so i was 22 she was 21 and so she knows better now so uh yeah but but she does you know i i, I have become more especially after having kids i've become more attuned to that and more sensitive to that to try to and i, I do try to prioritize time right to, to just sit and unplug and be around family and hang out and and do that so um yeah yeah so yeah. Um, probably the same time time frame here. My wife and I, we met when we were 15. And I, I often say she's seen me, anything stupid I've ever done, she knows about it. Like from that point of my life on. So I, there's nothing to oh, hide. Man. She knows exactly how I'm going to act and what I'm going to say and do. So that's funny to hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We lived in a small town. So like, yeah, not many secrets. And uh, yeah, growing up a lot since then, mainly because of her, which is awesome. So and if we if we rewound back to you as a kid, were you? I mean, you're an entrepreneur. No kidding. Right now, did you have that entrepreneurial spirit? Was it go 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 for you from the start? Yeah. And nowadays, someone probably would have said you need medication, right? Your ADHD. Um, like I was all over the place. I could focus though. Uh, I just got bored really easily, and uh, and I also had, uh, without sounding overly arrogant. I, I, I excelled at certain things. Like some things came natural to me, like academic activity, certain academic activities, athletics, you know, I was, I was, uh, talented in a lot of things. And so some things came easy to me, but that also, uh, you know, it, it got me in trouble, right? Because if I got bored or uh, I didn't always, uh, push myself to achieve the highest levels in any one thing. And so, um, I think some day, some 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 may say lack of focus. Others may say you know, entrepreneurial, which is a more you know polite way to say it. But uh, yeah, I was always bouncing around, always trying new things. And 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 to to you know, we talked about my wife. Like she's she's my counterpart, right? She's the opposite. She's very focused on one, maybe two things, and being excellent at them, right? And I've always been a generalist, like very versatile, yeah. decent at a lot of things, but um, but you know not excellent at any one, not, not an expert at any one particular thing. 
in most aspects of my life. So I, 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 I was entrepreneurial from a very young age. So two things there then. One, I don't want to lose the entrepreneurial thread, but I also want to ask something about being a generalist because I feel this way about myself as well. Do you think that that's maybe a positive attribute for an officer in the military? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I don't, I wouldn't wait uh, generalist for specialist in any one way with the exception or the caveat that you have to be self-aware. And so um knowing how to manage a variety of tasks, a variety of situations is good, but also being an expert in, in, in a certain situation is, is also helpful. Uh, I think where people get into to trouble is if you're a generalist, but think you're an expert, or if you're an expert and think you're you know yeah. versatile in a bunch of areas, that's where I think people get into trouble. Um, and so I think just as a leader, leadership, uh, one of the most important things is self, self-awareness, right? Uh, and so if you're self-aware, I think you're, if you're, if you're self-aware enough, you can compensate for any lack of expertise or, or lack of expertise, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that regard. So. And then the entrepreneurial angle that you brought up, um, what are some examples of you and that as, as you're growing up? Oh man, I, uh, I have tons. Um, I bounced around from job to job in high school. Like I was like, you know, trying this, doing that. Like I was a lifeguard initially, and then I was a dishwasher at a pizza place uh, which was awesome. It doesn't sound very entrepreneurial. And then worked at, uh, making subs at a convenience store, a Wawa for those of you guys on the East coast who know what Wawa is. That was my real, like, uh, that was my jam for a little while. And then I was a customer service rep at, a like a Dell call center, uh, which was terrible. I only lasted like a week after training before I quit. Cause it was just like mine, like the worst, um, experience ever, but, but I always bounce around and, uh, tried a lot of different things. Um, and then business wise, you know, I didn't, I didn't start any businesses or really do anything in high school. Um, I was really focused on trying to get into the military and, and things. And so, uh, it was probably later when I, I, th- I think I was in college, probably when I had my first like side hustle in business, um, besides just traditional jobs, but I was still entrepreneurial in that regard. So just real quick, before we get to what that side hustle may have been, what, what made, uh, washing dishes at a pizza joint. So awesome. Uh, it was awesome because at that time in my life, I was 15. And so no one else would hire me because you had to be 16. And so I was just like trying to get a job, wow. trying to get a job, trying to get a job. And, um, and, uh, went into a pizza place and just, you know, as you're, you're in former CIA, right. So you know how like the, the law of like, just walking in there, like you own the place or like you belong, how that impacts people. And so I just, you know, you know, it was overly confident and walked in there and they didn't, they never asked. And for months they never asked for my driver's license or anything. And so I was just getting paid. And so I had this job and, and then the job actually, it, I was fulfilled because I was doing something. It was menial labor, right? I was just washing dishes, but like, uh, I was making money and, uh, and then I also got two slices of free pizza every, or, you know, it's so like, it was, there cool. you go. It was easy, yeah. you know? And one of my friends from high school had worked there. He had, he'd like told me about it. He's like, Hey man, like, you should apply here and they probably won't ask you for a driver's license. And, uh, and so I did. And then, you know, so it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Was, was finding those jobs for you. Was that because you needed the money or you just needed something to go do? Cause you were bored. I was trying to make money, uh, just to be independent. Right. I was 15 and, and I was in a small town in Delaware and there wasn't tons going on. So nowadays, like, most parents probably don't want their kids washing dishes from like four to 10 PM on school nights, you know, three nights a week and whatever. But my parents were like, they, they also knew I was entrepreneurial and try to like, weren't overly controlling. And so I just got a job and came home and said, Hey mom, I got a job. Can you get it? And she's like, Oh gosh. All right, fine. Uh, like we'll go with it. So kind of like my wife, like they, they knew not to like try to like push me any one direction, but just to let it, just let it happen. Right. Like just let it go. Yeah. yeah happens. Um, so we'll, we'll jump to the side hustle in a second. I guess you mentioned you were always kind of focused on the military. Did that come from your folks? Where'd that come from? Yeah, it's been the family business. So my grandfathers were enlisted in the Air Force for um, careers in the Air Force. So one was 25 years, the other was 28 years. Uh, they were both enlisted and then they ended up in Texas. And that's how my parents met. My parents met in high school as well. Um, in Wichita Falls, Texas, near Shepard Air Force Base. Then my dad was an Air Force Academy grad and a pilot and spent a career in the Air Force um, until he retired. 
and so I was always exposed to it, always, you know, moved around a lot, um, and never was like pushed into it, but always just, expo- you know, and, and then ultimately what, it, what the clincher was, was, uh, you know, learning about Navy SEALs and watching the movie with Charlie Sheen, where, you know, I saw that and I was like, yep. that's what I want to do with my life. I'm going to go do that. And, uh, and so did that. And then was fortunate enough to apply and, and get accepted in the Naval Academy and, and kind of pursued it from there. Interesting. Okay. So okay. you've got two grandfathers who are Air Force, your old man is flying planes and then you take this route. So any, was there any family discussion there or how'd that no, go? No, a little bit. My dad, my dad was just happy. He's like, Hey, you should apply to West Point and Air Force too. And I applied. Um, but at the time uh, I lived in Delaware and had this girlfriend. Right. And I was like, Hey, I want to stay close. Uh, Cause my wife now is there. Um, I also was getting not recruited, but was allowed like in contact with the coaches for lacrosse and was able to walk on there. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to be a Navy SEAL and, you know, Annapolis is pretty awesome. And, uh, as it is, uh, way better than West Point. So, uh, Air Force Academy is cool, but you know, but different as well. And actually I, I lived at the Air Force Academy for two years with my dad in middle school and it was awesome. But, um, but Annapolis is where, where I wanted to go. Yeah. And so, so once I got in, I, I didn't even finish. I had like the other applications in process and just didn't even bother. Cause I was like, all right, I got in, I'm done. And, and I, I mean, spoiler alert, but you don't become a seal, right? So what, what happens between this desire and then you becoming a Marine? Yeah. So this was one of the life-changing moments, you know, for me and where I can look back on my life thus far and, and point to a few instances where I was seriously humbled in a good way. And up until my point, that point in my life, um, I'd been naturally talented, versatile, able to achieve success in a variety of areas, but I was really arrogant, overconfident, cocky. Um, and, uh, and I had the wrong idea. I had a total misunderstanding, a fundamental misunderstanding of what special operators should be. And so even though I was physically talented and academically talented and did all these things, I went into that interview for service selection at the Naval Academy my senior year and just like could not have gone worse, right? Like I was the, I highlighted the, the aspects of my personality at that time, which were true and relevant, which were very clear, made it very clear to them that like, this guy is not mature enough yet to become a special operator, right? To be Navy SEAL. And so that was hard to deal with, but, uh, but what it did was it forced me to, to reevaluate and look internally, right. And, and take ownership of that and say, Hey, like, I just screwed this up. This could, this is a life-changing incident and what's in my control. What can I do about it? Uh, and the reality was, was I could be a better person, right? I could learn, uh, to not be arrogant, not be overconfident, to be, uh, more humble, more hardworking, uh, you know, to, to change a lot of the, the things about who I was up to that point in my life, uh, so that in the future I would be more successful and I wouldn't be, you know, I, I would learn something from that. Right. And that this lesson wouldn't go to waste. So I'm not familiar with the service selection interviews. Is this like a, maybe your junior year, when, when does this happen? And what is that? Is it a series of interviews you sit down or is it one person kind of deciding your fate? It's uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of high stakes, right? So it's like, gotta be intense so the way you just senior, described it, man. Yeah. So your senior year at the Naval Academy. Um, so up all up until, up until the point from the time you're a plebe until your senior year and you graduate, you can kind of start to get more uh, focused on your path that you want to pursue. And so like, you know, each summer you're doing summer trainings, just like you do with ROTC, like Corchermit and all that stuff. Um, you have to go on ship for a little bit, but you know, you can kind of put yourself in a position to try to explore more. And then like right before the senior year, they do a, a period of training called mini buds, which is kind of cool. And I think they still do it today, but, uh, people that want to select to become a seal will kind of go through a little like weekend mini hell week screener at the Naval Academy. And then you can get one of the slots and then you go out the summer for four weeks and you go to Coronado and they just like train you for, you know, a few weeks and you get a taste of it and they can kind of see who you are and, you know, how you perform in certain aspects. Um, and then you come back the senior year and in the fall of the senior year, you start to do these interviews. You have to list, you know, so you go number one through number six for 
seal submarines ships planes whatever marine corps all, you, you rank order everything from top to bottom based on your preference and then there is a selection process whereby the most qualified people get matched with the jobs that they want um, and so for seals it was competitive so there was like probably 40 to 50 people who were applying to become a seal officer is very competitive I only had like 20 slots um, or 23, I think the year that we graduated, but uh, they go through that. And then, you know, they kind of see your package and your history and everything else and uh, what you've done as a midshipman for the entire time. Um, and then they bring you in to a, a room with like, it was like five to seven seals enlisted an officer that come in there and they're boarding these people because for them, they're investing time because this is going to be the future of the officer corps of not the future, not all the seals, but, half of them or so come from academies, I think. And then the other half come from ROTC for these slots and there's not a ton of slots. So this is very integral to the culture of the SEAL pipeline and the SEAL community. And so they send people out to come and you're in there for, I think maybe 20 or 30 minutes with them. And they just review your package, ask you certain things. And so uh, my package wasn't overly compelling at the beginning too, because I had gotten a lot of trouble as a midshipman. I was, you know, arrogant and breaking rules and whatever. And I almost got kicked out my freshman year uh, for doing stupid stuff. Yeah. Um, and then when they asked me about it, you know, they're like, Hey, what's, what's up with this? What did you, what's the deal with this? And I, I said, Oh, well, you know, yeah, I, I made some decisions. I took some liberties I shouldn't have, but uh, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. Right. And they're like, that's not, you, you don't sound like you learned anything. Right. Like, and then it just went downhill from there. Right. Damn. It was just, it was bad. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and I just, I could, it couldn't have gone worse, but it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Right. Because I learned so much from it and it, and it changed my life. Right. Um, in so many ways. Did you rebound as fast as it sounds like, I mean, and you had already done the mini buds the, <laughs> the summer and then you get out to this. I mean, yeah. it was, it was pretty, it was pretty sad. I, you know, it took a while to pick myself back up, God uh, dang, man. but you don't really have a choice either because then it's like, all right, I didn't get my first choice. Am I going to get my second choice? Am I going to get my third choice? You know, do I just keep wallowing in self-pity or like, how am I going to maneuver myself to get a career that I'm not going to hate? You know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so then I didn't get my second choice either. And then I was about to get my third choice, which I was debating on and I was talking to someone and luckily a mentor of mine intervened. So I was, I was deciding between the Marine Corps or the submarines uh, as a submarine officer. Because as a submarine officer, you get paid a $10,000 bonus for if you get accepted and then whatever. And I was like, all right, fine. 10,000 bucks sounds good. I don't have any money. Like I'll do five years and get out and whatever. Um, but one of my mentors at that time had been a Marine and he was like, he was a Marine officer at the, the Naval Academy and said, Derek, I don't think this is really what you want to do. Like the Marine Corps at the Naval Academy is very different than the Marine Corps in the real world. And I think you'd be a good Marine officer. I think you should reconsider this. I'm willing to help you and go to bat for you with the selection committee, even though it's your third choice. And even though you, you, know, you didn't get selected for these other choices, but only if you promise me that like, this is, you, you know, look me in the eye and tell me like, this is what you want. And you commit to this hundred percent. Right. And I was like, I'm in like, Damn. this is you're right. Damn. And, uh, and he did. And I was really lucky because that year, the Marine Corps ground slots were competitive as well. I think there was over 400 people who put it as their first choice. There were only like 200 slots and somehow I, you know, he was able to help me be competitive as an applicant and get that slot. And if I hadn't, I wouldn't be a Marine. What was number two on the list out of curiosity? Uh, I was Navy EOD. So Navy uh, special operations. So, um, wow. yeah, which is a cool job. I mean, it's, it's yeah. awesome. It sounded cool, but didn't get that one either. So Damn. how interesting. And now looking at, at what we're about to talk about and where you sit now and you're on a board for the Marine Raider Foundation. Like, so it seems like you landed in the right place, needless to say. Damn. Yeah, I, I wouldn't change a thing. All right, let's, um, I, I want to make sure I don't lose this. You mentioned you had a little side hustle or two going on in college. I don't know how the hell you do that at the academy. What, the, what were you doing? I'll tell you how. So uh, <laughs> my senior year, um, we, you serve a select in the Marine Corps. And then one of the things you have to do is you're, you don't have any uniforms. You don't have any Marine uniforms because you're a midshipman. And so you have to buy uniforms and the people that they have access to, to come sell you uniforms, like 
upcharge a ton. Right. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know. It seemed like a lot. They were like, Oh, it's like a hundred bucks for a camouflage pants, a hundred bucks. for. And so as a midshipman, you don't have any money and you're like, man, I got to spend like 5,000 bucks just to get uniforms. I got to spend a thousand bucks on a sword. I got to do all this stuff. So, so at that time, um, I realized there was an arbitrage opportunity because I'd you know seen eBay and bought stuff on eBay and everything. And so I was buying used uniforms and used boots and stuff like that, like camis and all that stuff. Um, I would buy them. They'd get shipped to the Naval Academy. I'd unpack them and then sell them to other midshipmen for a small markup, right? So I'd get like a camouflage blouse for 10 bucks and sell it for 20 bucks and, you know, made a little bit of money that way. Which, nice. Uh, which was always a win-win for everybody, right? Because... Um, you know, Mitch and were able to save money and still get uniforms, my classmates. And then I was able to make a little bit of money and pay off my uniforms, all that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, that's cool. That's cool. All right. Yeah. And I know we'll talk more about what is now like some, some serious for-profit work that sounds like came from these types of beginnings. So if we then fast forward, you go into the Marine Corps almost on this, I mean, circuitous route, but it's, it's the right place for you to land. How long is it before you're at a unit and, and you're coming out in 06, right? So you're graduating in a really high op tempo time and it's just getting, getting hotter. What's it, what's the feeling like, I guess, coming into the force at that time and what unit do you get to? Yeah. The feeling when I got commissioned, right. The day of graduation was like, uh, rebirth, right? Like all the stuff I did at the Naval Academy, good, bad, or ugly, doesn't matter. Moving forward, like, this is my profession. Every day that I have, every minute, every opportunity I have is going to either positively or negatively help me accomplish my goal of being the best Marine officer I can be, right? And very soon, I will be tested in battle because I know exactly where these guys are, these men and women in battle, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, all across the world. Uh, and people will be counting on me to lead them. And the decisions I make, every decision I make moving forward, will either help me prepare to accomplish that mission or not. And so literally from the second I became, you know, a second Lieutenant pinned on the, you know, the insignia, it was just completely complete compartmentalization of anything in the past and just moving forward with that mindset. And so everything I did was to prepare because I knew that I would be in Iraq or Afghanistan and maybe a year, maybe two years, who knows. Right. And so, uh, that was the mindset of everybody at that time, I think, and particularly for me moving forward. And so then I went through the basic school, which is about six months of training in Quantico for every Marine officer. And then there we did another service selection, like another specialty selection. I selected infantry and I got it, which was good. Which is competitive also, right? Super competitive. Most times it was. Uh, this time it wasn't. So <laughs> I was fortunate. Like I worked my ass off in, in the basic school and I did well um, and graduated in like I wasn't in the top 10%, but I was almost in the top 10% uh, of the class. Um, but, uh, but regardless, just worked hard uh, and moved forward. Um, and initially, they had only had 30 slots out of like 220 for infantry officers. But because the Marine Corps at that time in 2006, we needed to expand the Marine Corps. So they said, hey, we're going to grow from 190,000 troops to 220,000. And part of that is an entire new infantry regiment, 9th Marine Regiment, that's going to be growing. And so we need actually 60 infantry officers instead of 30. And so they came back and uh, this was like right before we were selecting. And so then people are starting to freak out because they're like, I don't know 60 guys who want to be infantry officers. Like there's probably like 45 or 50 maybe. <laughs> and so people are going to get selected to infantry that don't want to. And so there was a guy in our platoon who had it as like his 12th choice. And they were like, <laughs> sorry man like you gotta right. move forward like you can't can't cry about it like you're gonna be leading people in combat and they're gonna be expecting you to, to do wow. this so like it's the needs of the marine corps um so it wasn't as competitive but even if it was i was hopeful i'd position myself much better to to, to get selected there and then yeah. went through the infantry officer course was about three months of training which is awesome because a lot of our instructors were fresh off the battlefield in iraq and afghanistan uh done a, insane things and we had guys like Brian Chantosh, who was a Navy Cross recipient um, for actions in Iraq and, and just very, very clear to us. And they reinforced uh, just how real everything was and, and what the severity is of the situation we'd find ourselves in shortly. 
So it, as you mentioned this, like the break from coming out of the academy and all right, all that's behind me. I'm super focused because I'm leading troops. Was there any of that focus that came because of that mentor of yours saying, Hey, I'm, I'm going to get you into this, but like, you gotta, you gotta dedicate to it. Do you think you would have been as, as focused maybe had that not played out the way it did? Uh, yeah, direct, uh, yes. The answer is yes. It, it, it would not have been as focused if I didn't have his mentorship, but uh, it was much more than just him too. So he single-handedly helped me get in the Marine Corps. If it was not for him, I would not be in the Marine Corps. Um, but all the other training that, you know, and all the other leadership lessons and everything else that I learned at the Naval Academy and previously and everything else all, all mattered too. Right. And it kind of came into focus. So like you have these, yeah. these life events that happen to you or that, you know, that you encounter. And sometimes they put other things that you, other lessons you should have learned, or you've been taught into greater context that enable you to actually see uh, what the meaning and the value and impact of those are. And so like all that time, right. You get so much leadership. Like we had leadership lessons every month. Like we were doing yeah. all of this stuff. Nobody right? doesn't like the Marines. Nobody. Yeah. Up in, but up until I'd been humbled and then had the contextual awareness and the clarity of that, all of that came together and, and, and helped me move forward. And then even after that, every time, you know, beyond that too, like, you know, it doesn't stop. It's a continuous continuous evolution of learning. Okay. So, so you, you arrived to your unit. Um, how long until you guys are downrange? Cause that's, I mean, yeah. you're at the height of height of a serious bat war at that point in time. Yeah. We, we were uh, optimistic that we'd be, you know, uh, tested soon and deploying soon. But for us, uh, because of the ramp up of the Marine Corps, a lot of us, in the time and we got sent to, to ninth Marine regiment. And, and for us, it was a long time before we deployed. Um, and so good or bad, uh, it, you know, it was about a year, uh, of training stateside before we deployed. And so I didn't get to deploy until 2008 actually. So, um, so it was just a very different time. Whereas some of my classmates from that got out, they were deployed like a month later. Um, yeah. you know, and so it was just kind of a hit or miss based on the operational cycles of which battalion you go to. And, and so some cases, you know, we may say, oh, well, you know, we missed out on all this combat in Iraq and whatever else. And other cases, you know, say it's not, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Like you go where you go and you do what you, you accomplish the mission you're given. So, yeah. um, so that was, that was the situation. So we had a long time and, and the, the value of that was uh, I had a year to work with and train my platoon and to prepare. Right. And, and so um take advantage of all that time we had so yeah. uh as opposed to just showing up with a unit that's already formed and they're like oh hey boss pack your stuff like we're, we're getting on a plane to iraq right and you're like oh man like how am i going to figure that one out which is a totally different problem set and, uh, and other challenges presented so so you, so you go down range in 08 can you take us through maybe that first combat experience and, and where are you are you going into iraq afghanistan yeah we went into iraq we were in our ramadi iraq and um we showed up and, and it was kind of on the tail end of any sort of combat operations. So there'd been pretty significant uh, drawdown in forces. In fact, our battalion was taken over the battle space of three battalions um, and also an army brigade headquarters. So we were split up into like all over Ramadi, which presented some opportunities and challenges and was kind of the way forward. Um, and so what that did was that gave us great latitude. So I was in charge of a small team. I wasn't even, we kind of broke up into small transition teams. So I had a, instead of having a platoon of 40 Marines and sailors broke down and, and actually had a team of 12 and, uh, and we had wow. positions that we were assigned with. So we were kind of like, uh, you know, uh, poor man SF team. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was like me, a Sergeant, and then, you know, 10 Lance corporals. Right. Uh, who are like very junior enlisted young, young, right. So young. So like kind of like an SF team just with very, you know, not all the training. Right. Uh, and, uh, not all the assets, um, and, uh, trying to accomplish the same sort of thing. So, so we did. And so we had police stations we were partnered with and working with, and, uh, it was a great deployment. Um, had a lot of fun, uh, first time going out of the wire, you know, was interesting, but at the same time, you know, it was very peaceful, uh, and non-combative. Uh, in that regard. And so the first real, I think the first real um, combat operations we had, we didn't, we didn't really engage in much combat during that time, but we were supporting a lot of things. And so what that strategy allowed us to do was 
allow the Iraqis to take the lead in all of the policing efforts and any sort of combative efforts. And they, they were in combat um, doing things uh, and, you know, getting attacked and, and all these sorts of things. Um, the operations that we participated in were much, uh, much different. So for example, one day we told them, and, th and this was, this is an interesting story. So one day, you know, like we told them, Hey, uh, we have this intelligence that there's someone uh, who's likely going to pack explosives into a scooter and use it to detonate and uh, use it as an IED and improvise explosive device, a scooter IED. Right. And they're like, Oh man, this is dangerous. You know, the police chief's like, Colonel, he's like talking to me. I'm a 23 year old second lieutenant. He's a 50 year old <laughs> experienced Iraqi police chief. And he's like, don't worry about this. You know, Lieutenant Herrera, we're going to take care of this. And so I'm like, all right. And the next day I show up and it's like, parking lot of scooters right so they just went through online through the entire town and impounded every single scooter in a town of like fifty thousand people and there's things that like hundreds and hundreds of scooters and like all right like not the way i would have done this but effective nonetheless i guess so uh did, yeah. did you send the eod guy to the, like inspect every one of them basically i should have uh we didn't have an eod guy right so like yeah we, yeah, yeah. So we were just kind of went with it, but, um, but that actually got them in trouble too. So like, uh, similar situation there was towards the end of our deployment, uh, a very catastrophic incident. Someone had packed a lot of explosives into a, a truck, a pickup truck. And our policeman went out and they kind of phoned in a tip and our policeman went out and kind of did the inspection on it, but it was high quality, uh, job that the insurgents had done. And they'd hidden the explosives very well in the truck bed, about 150 pounds of explosives. Uh, so they got in, and they're like, oh, yeah, the keys are in it. Okay, cool. And so they're, they're bringing it back to the police station as a prize, right? Like, look, we just got this new pickup truck. That somebody left on the side of the road. And then it detonated and killed uh, driver and passenger. But then seven policemen had jumped in the back to celebrate, right? And so this thing goes off and just like terrible day, right? But, um, you know, we just responded and, and tried to help support however we could uh, for those incidents. Man. But uh, but just weird times. But it, but. Luckily for us, there were very few and and far between incidents of of combat on that deployment. Um, the only one that came close, we we did uh, we did raids. So my team actually did a lot of raids in the on that deployment where uh, we had information about someone who was planning certain things or may have been a threat. Um, but at that time, every time we'd go in and you know uh, capture them. Uh, there would not be any, you know, it wouldn't be combative, right? We would sneak up, take them, and then take them back and process them. Uh, and so we were successful, I think, five for five on some of those, like, missions, which were yeah. interesting. Um, and, yeah, so that was that was kind of the deployment. So a couple things there. How, I mean, did you train up for that type of combat where, like, I, I think most of us envision a Marine platoon is – is working together with your 40 guys. It's, it's got this more, um, kind of deliberate mission set. And then all of a sudden you're with 12 folks, like platoon minus to the extreme. Um, how, how was the platoon feeling about that mission set going into combat, especially for you as your first time in, in the shoot? Yeah. I think for the leadership, we thought it was awesome because we're like, oh man, nice special operation. Like, yeah, we're going to be out running <laughs> around with low people. Like this is, is going to be awesome. You know, it's our chance to be pretend special operators. Right. Um, but for a lot of the guys that enlisted the guys, they're like, you know, like I said, 10 out of 12 were fresh. This is our first deployment. Right. And they're like average age of like 19. Right. And so they're like, this is bullshit. This isn't what I signed up for. You know, like just going to like, go hang out and drink tea and do like, oh man, this, what a waste of time. You know, like it was hard keeping everybody motivated uh, through that. Um, Cause they signed up to go, you know, they signed yeah. up in 2006 and they signed up to go fight. Right. And go slay dragons. Right. And go do everything that Marines are supposed to do. Um, and by the time they get there, it's like a totally different mission set than what's traditional of Marines. Uh, and, you know, not it's more traditional of special forces and army and, and fit mission, but a foreign internal defense mission. Yep. But um, most 19 year olds don't join the Marine Corps to, to go do fit. Right. They join to go, you know, fight and close with and destroy the enemy. Right. 
Uh, and so it was just, it was different. Um, and we found out that this was going to be the case maybe two or three months before we shipped out. So we actually tried to, we, our, our battalion did a really good job, I think, of preparing us because they overnight modified all of our training packages, all of our final exercises to, to try to mimic that and mirror that. And so, okay. so we had some time. So like previously where we would do a pre-deployment certification exercise or a final month long exercise in the desert, it previously was called combined arms exercise out in 29 Palms. We'd go and you'd be able to drop ordnance and do all of these very kinetic things. They kind of like very rapidly changed that to where it's like, okay, well, you're going to be hanging out working with Iraqis. How do we get Iraqi role players in here? How do we get cultural training? How do we get, you know, all of these things that are going to be able to help prepare you for this mission? Um, I, I feel like organizationally it was, it probably could be faster, but it was looking back on it, it was pretty fast the way that the entire machine was able to, to integrate some of those lessons learned and prepare the training for us. Yeah. So I would love to talk just for a second as you, as you were describing how like, Hey, it's hard to motivate people who want to go do one thing in a job and they're not able to do it. And you, you know, for could be said you're, you're in leadership positions from that point on until today. Um, and you run several businesses and efforts to this day. And I, I'm sure you run into the same thing with people who are doing a job. Maybe they don't get excited about and you got to motivate them at that time. Did you have anything in particular you did to keep them motivated? Cause I do believe a lot of people think, Oh, they're a Marine. They're just going to salute and do what you say, but it, that's the easy answer out. And that's not the reality when you're day in and day out in combat. Right. So what, what did you do at the time for yeah. that? It was tough. The most, the, the things that I did, I think that, uh, engendered rapport and respect amongst the Marines was, uh, to not like sugarcoat things, to be honest with them, to be transparent with them and to try to, uh, advocate on their behalf, try not to waste their time, try not to try to minimize like the stuff we could control. So I, I can't control what mission we're given, right? If it's FID, if it's DA, I can't control what we're going to do in most cases, right? Like I cannot do that, but this is the mission we've been given. I didn't, you know, I didn't expect it either, but this is what we're here. This is what we're getting paid to do. We're going to do the job. We should do it well, right? Um, what I could control or try to control is to prevent wasting their time, bureaucratic nonsense, other shenanigans as much as I could. Cause we also had, you know, uh, my company commander on that deployment was, was an interesting guy. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from him. Good and bad, right? Good and bad. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, so, like, you know, that, that was the best I could do was to try to say, hey, guys, let's just keep this thing on the right. Like, and over time, seven months is a long time. If people are like, if you're already kind of unhappy, but then you have additional stressors placed on, and this is something that I think translates to the corporate environment. Yeah, if you're already yeah. not overly excited about your job, and then you have additional stressors, which could have been mitigated or are completely unnecessary. That your leadership, you think your leadership could have handled or could have advocated better for you, like you're gonna like it even less, right? And uh, and so for me, the way I kind of saw myself was like, all right, how do I absorb as much as I can and protect them from all of this, not create additional nonsense, and at least be honest and transparent with them. So we're like, you know, I'm not trying to sell them stuff that isn't there or like, you know try to motivate them, right? Like you, you can try to motivate as much as you want. You're like, Hey guys, we're going to go out and, you know, we're going to go build this school and it's going to be awesome. And I know this is what you signed up to do. And you're like, yeah, it's important, but like, you know, uh, you don't have to like oversell. So, yeah. um, and I find that the same way now and like corporations, right. It's like just being genuine, being authentic. You can be transparent in most respects, but then also just trying to be a good leader and shield them from additional nonsense or anything that's unnecessary, which may also just like drive them nuts. How did you personally feel about being a Marine at that time? Like, I mean, it wasn't what you envisioned four years prior and now you're coming out, you're in and coming out of this deployment. What, what was that feeling like for you of being a Marine now? It was awesome. I loved it. Like, so from the day, from the, like pretty much like every day moving forward from graduating, I, I loved it. Like, it was awesome. I had such a good time doing interesting things with great people uh, for a mission and purpose that I believed in. So like, 
I didn't look back. Like I was, you know, I didn't look back and then, and then, so that was out of my control. Right. So like the past was gone moving forward. It's like, Hey, what am I going to do now? Like I'm going to go be the best century officer I can be. And then beyond that, it's like, Oh, am I going to stay in the Marine Corps or not? Like I like being a Marine. I love this job. Uh, I love the people. If I'm going to stay in, what else am I going to do? Right. And then that's where the ideas, uh, it'd come together for like reconnaissance units or special operations community or screening to go to even more, challenging situations and environments. Perfect. This is a good setup. So as we, as we come out of, well, maybe it's in this deployment there, it kind of comes full circle with the seals, right? Where you didn't get in to begin with, but then there's a point in time where they kind of need your help. And I was hoping you might be able to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So it was fun. Great, great deployment. Um, we had for some of those who may or may not know, there's conventional forces and special operations forces operating in similar areas. A lot of times they have similar, uh, you know, operational areas, but there's a battle space owner, uh, one person who's responsible at the end of the day for what happens in a certain area. And so sometimes special operations units will own their own battle space. Sometimes it'll be the conventional forces that own it. Whoever owns it has to coordinate operations for that area uh, within those boundaries. And so, the SEALs that were deployed to this area would coordinate all of their operations or at least notify us when things were happening and everything else. And so one night uh, they went on a mission and somehow either didn't notify them or the notif- I, I don't know the story of how the communications or emails or slides didn't go through or anything like that. But, but what ended up happening was uh, the SEALs had intelligence or information that somebody was going to be implanting an IED in the ground and, they mounted a mission with some of their partners to go and, and kill or capture this guy in the act while he's doing this. Um, and so they're like, all right, it's going to happen at night. We're going to try to be sneaky. We're going to dress in local garb. We're going to wear what they wear. We're going to use AK 47s and Toyota Hiluxes. And so eight service members get dressed up, you know, and uh, go out and we didn't get the memo. So I didn't tell my police or anything. And, uh, and so they're out there and, a relatively populated urban area in the summer in Iraq where it's hot and our town had instituted a curfew at 9 PM. So like the police were like, Hey, if you're on the streets after 9 PM, like we're going to arrest you or get you in your house. Right. Uh, But it's hot in the summer and there's no air conditioning. So almost everybody is on their rooftop. They're sleeping on their rooftops where they can see things. Right. And so they see eight people get out of two Toyota Hiluxes armed setting an ambush. And they're like, what the heck is going on? And so then they called a tip line because our police had at that point were mature enough to put out a tip line, like a 911, call your local police. Uh, so they call the police station and our police had been pretty well trained at that point. They've been trained for, I don't know, five or six years before we got there by all kinds of people. And so they, you know, mounted a good operation with like 50 policemen and circled them and, and captured the seals and took them back to the station and, zip, you know, like arrested them, basically the whole thing. Um, and we get a call and they're like, Hey, uh, we got to go bail out the seal. Like what the hell happened? Right. And like, sure enough, like they had done full exploitation and documentation of serial, like, cause these guys have been taught no way all the TTPs. So like, and so the seals, I, I meet them the next day, someone else had gone to go, we coordinated their release and they drove back. Uh, but then the next day these guys are like, Hey, um, you need to go in and make sure they delete every single image with our social security numbers, all of our weapon serial numbers, all of this stuff. Right. And so I was like, Roger that. Like, yeah, I got you, man. Like, don't worry about it. So, uh, so it was interesting. Um, I don't know whose fault it was, but like, uh, yeah, they got bailed out. Uh, from nobody got hurt was, though. Nobody got hurt. And, uh, and I was actually really proud of our police cause they did a yeah, really yeah. good job. Like capturing eight Navy seals is not, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not an easy feat. I would say, uh, by any means, um, oh, man. that must've been so. a fate worse than, than death for those guys getting, getting <laughs> rolled up and <laughs> taken in. Uh, I don't know if they'll ever live it down. Uh, yeah. I don't know too many of those guys. Cause you know, at that point I was just a second lieutenant of battalion. So we weren't allowed to talk to anybody and they, you know, had their, their cool base camp Mark Lee shark base there on Ramadi and, uh, you know, and the only time I went there, I went there one time after that to coordinate a mission that we were doing with them after they'd learned that. Cause they're like, Hey, in light of recent events, do you guys want to go out and try to kill this guy that's placing an IED? And we're like, yeah, we'll go do that. Like, nice. Okay. So, um, so anyways, we got to bail did, them out. Fun did story. you go and do an op with them? Like 
dressed in local stuff? No, we were not allowed to do that. We were not that cool. Um, in fact, when we talked to him, we we're like, Hey, yeah, I think, uh, if we were to do that, it's going to look more out of place than just walking around in our camis. So if you're like actually trying to blend in with the operational environment, like put on some camis like us and walk around like that. Right. But yeah. Damn. Nice. Dang. Okay. So, so you come back from this first deployment, it's a good experience. Do you then decide, all right, I'm going down the special ops route. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I kind of made my mind up at the end. I'd, I'd heard about this new organization called MARSOC, which was the Marine Special Operations Command. It was a small contingent of Marines that had recently been assigned to SOCOM. So up until 2006, there was no special operations Marine component. Um, there was recon and force recon, which were uh, highly trained and specialized units in the Marine Corps, but they reported to the Marine Corps, not to Special Operations Command. Um, and that was up to 2006. And so in 2006, they signed the order and there became MARSOC or what we know today as the Marine Raider community. And so uh, they were creating it. They had created an assessment selection process, much like Green Berets. In fact, you know, they paid Green Berets to work as civilian contractors to, to, to do selection for us. Um, so very similar process. Uh, and so when I got back, after I got back from deployment, I talked to my battalion commander. I was like, hey, you know, I, I want to go do this. I want to go to, you know, a reconnaissance unit or MARSOC or whatever. And he's like, we're not sending you to recon. You know, you're going to, you're not going there. You're going to be a company XO, right? Like you're going to deploy again. You're going to be a company XO. I'm like, good to go. Roger that, sir. Uh, but then I was able to talk with the special operations recruiters and then get orders to go selection. I'm like, Hey, sir, like, I know I'm going to be deploying again. I got another deployment, but like, can I at least go take selection for three weeks and just, or 10 days at that time uh, and see, you know, see if I get selected or whatever. It's like, fine. Like, all right. Um, so I did and I went through and I got selected. And then when I was at selection, what I found was the professionalism, the people, and, you know, uh, really that was at the, the level of professionalism and the people that I was around. It was the highest caliber Marines I'd ever been around. Um, and the level of professionalism at selection was, uh, higher than any other, you know, course or event or training evolution I'd been to that point. And so I was like, if I stay in, this is what I want to do. Right. And so I gotten selected, fortunate to get selected at the end of it. Um, and then went back to my unit and I had to go to play again before I could get orders, but then I was able to get orders to, uh, to the unit after that. Damn, so you did another deployment conventional. Yeah. Where'd you go for that one? Uh, I was on a ship on the Marine Expeditionary Unit. So we were transiting all over the Middle East doing non-combat operations. And, um, and so we went to Haiti, Europe, Africa, and almost every country in the Middle East, except for like Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Dang. Okay. So, so you did your time there basically like- Yeah, almost four years. Yeah, so it was a long time. And so like, so one of my buddies, right? So one of my, so, and, and the rule for Marsoc at that time is still kind of, timing based, especially for officers when you could get orders. Um, but the rule was basically two deployments. So some people got two deployments in like 18 months, right. And yeah. they were over other people like me got them in like four years. Right. So I was already like really senior. Right. By the time I had gotten a chance to go over there, I was a captain by the, before I even got to go over there. Whereas like one of my buddies was able to get over there about two years before I was. Um, and so he was my company XO when I showed up at my unit before I, you know, deployed. Um, which was awesome. But, uh, but I ended up going to training, started training in 2011 after four years in the infantry. Um, and I had a blast. I learned a ton as a company XO and I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was not, not what I wanted, but it was good for me. Um, and I enjoyed it. I had a great time. So. Are they training you when you're, when you're going through selection and then the pipeline, less selection, I guess, but you were mentioning that they brought in, you know, former green berets to help are they training you in a similar mission set or is it, is it yeah. also direct action? Or are you also doing FID? So just like everything in the Marine Corps, we're like utility knife, right? So we will do whatever anybody asks. Uh, we're not as um, established to say, we're not doing that. This is what we're doing, right? We're just like new man. And it's kind of good. Like the mindset kind of was something I learned to embrace, which was like, if somebody asks you to do something, you know, the answer is yes, right? Like you make yourself yeah, yeah. valuable. And that's helped, I think, establish the, the Raider community and SOCOM is like, you know, if you ask SEALs to go to something like, ah, we'll do it. But like, 
you know, that's not <laughs> our mission, right? Like there's no water in Afghanistan. You know, like uh, I give them a hard time joking around, but like, yeah. but for us, it was like, Oh, you got a J set to, to like uh, the Philippines. Like, yeah, we'll take that. Right. Like, well, what, what, like we were just hungry. Right. And, and hardworking and humble. Uh, and that goes a long way for anybody, whether it's a person or team or organization, if that's your reputation, then people will like working with you and want to use you. And so we took, so Marsoc, from what I understand, and even as I was seeing it on the back end, as like kind of an operations officer and some of the planning and stuff, we were like, we do anything, right? Because we were just trying to uh, establish relevance, establish relationships and like be successful and keep it going, keep this experiment of Marines and special operations community going. Um, and so that was, that was it. So, so to go back to your point about the mission set, what we say on paper is DA, SR, FID, uh, I think, uh, I can't remember if it's UW or CT, like, we don't, I don't know if we have UW, we still do, like, we, we basically do like a mini, we do Q course, right? So we have like, kind of like a, a Robin Sage-like exercise, mm-hmm. which we call Derna Bridge. Um, we don't do diving or jumping, so none of that's in the pipeline, Um I mean, we do it, but it's, it's after you graduate. So it's not part of the pipeline, like it is for seals and green berets and everything. And, uh, and we do language training and everything, but, um, but in general, we're kind of utilitarian. Right. And so like, like we deployed to Afghanistan, you know, seals are doing the same missions that green berets that we are, you know, we're all yeah, kind of yeah. doing it. So how, how are your folks feeling about you going down this path? Right. I mean, you kind of have the departure going to the Navy, then you're in the Marines and now you're getting deeper into special ops. Like, yeah. H- how did that go? They were just happy, right? They're just, I'm sure they were worried about me, but they never once were they like overly, you know, I don't, I can't remember a time they were overly like concerned or scared. I think, I think it's similar to the kind of like the way that they, they treated me when I was growing up. It was like, you are an adult not like you're making these decisions. Like you're, we know better than to try to like influence talk you out of it. Yeah. yeah like, cause we know if we try that, like you have a history of, of being kind of like anti authoritarian and rebellious. And so like, we know if we say anything to do that or try to influence anything you do, like you're just going to want to do it more. Right. And like faster and hard, like, so, you know, we're just yeah. proud of you for what you're doing. Yeah. Right. They, they were just proud. Like they were very proud of, you know, and they still are very proud of, uh, being in the military, serving the country, all those things. So uh, they didn't care that I wasn't a pilot or that I was, you know, but, uh, but obviously, um, you know, that, that I was in, you know, very dangerous situations just Hell like yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Man. So as you roll into this new community and you were talking about just in the training environment, the caliber of people, I'm sure once you get to the units, it's just like another level. Um, I know we're going to get into some heavy moments here for you. Um, just timeline wise, are we talking like 2011 you're arriving and how, yeah. how many deployments do you end up doing with them? Yeah. So I arrived in 2011. Uh, that's when I graduated from um, the individual training course, which is kind of like the, it was about eight months, I think it's kind of like a Q course. Um, very similar. Uh to, to that. And so from 2010 to 2011, I did that. I transferred from North Carolina out to California, uh, to Camp Pendleton, California, to First Marine Raider Battalion. Um, we had a battalion out here and the other two in the headquarters is in North Carolina. Um, and now actually they're all in North Carolina. Um, but uh, arrived in my unit in 2011 and then had about a year to train and prepare for deployment to Afghanistan. And so I deployed in 2012 uh, in May. 2012 to Afghanistan for my first and, and only deployment as a, a special operator. Got it. Okay. So take me to the first op you do with that unit, right? So this is a stark difference I'm imagining from this first, certainly the first deployment, definitely the second being on a ship, I would imagine. So yeah. now you're in the elite unit. What was that like for you doing those ops? What was the first one like? Yeah. So uh, the first one, I, I honestly don't even remember the first one because for us, the mission that we were doing was basically one long mission. Um, every moment 
we were under duress, like we were under threat of enemy engagement because we were out, we were doing what's called village stability operations. And so it's actually even before my yeah. team got there, I had done a, a pre-deployment uh, site survey where I, as the captain, as a team commander, got to fly out and go to Afghanistan for two weeks before my team deployed and go there. And like, I'd gotten put in for a combat action ribbon for that, like two weeks, because in that two weeks we were out running around, like, you know, we went on a patrol and like, you know, I got to go on patrol once with the team that was there and see how it was. But, but the situation there was like, we were in a small village in uh, a rural area of Helmand province, Afghanistan. And we were trying to improve the security economy and political situation there um, for that reason. So they would withstand Taliban influence. The situation was, was like, we can't go, we can't walk a mile or for more than 30 minutes without getting in a firefight or having someone get blown up uh, by an IED. Like this is as combative as probably anywhere in the world or any, you know, any other, you know, situation there. And so, um, so in the two weeks before I even got there, you know, we arrived and there was a lot of activity and we went on patrol and got into an engagement. Uh, and that was my first, you know, combat engagement, um, where people were firing rounds and, you know, uh, and that was interesting. Um, and then we arrived as a team, you know, as soon as we got out outside the wire and started to, to, to do the turnover with the, uh, the group we were with, it was, it's kind of kind of interesting. We get attacked in the bot, the base. We we're in this kind of small, you know, fixed site, this base that we we're in, and get attacked, you know, three four times a day with people harassing us and and those sorts of things. And um, yeah, it was it was interesting. It was just to take stock of that situation. Yeah, and stability ops. I mean, we're talking about as you described, like building up the economy, just the local services. Like you're out in the day. I would imagine you you're you're not doing these surgical strikes at night where you choose the time and location necessarily like you're just yeah. out there hanging it out yeah. yeah yeah it was nonstop. and so like the situation on the ground it was it was interesting so um we arrived and we were getting attacked multiple times a day and as a team we kind of came together and uh came up with a plan to to see what we wanted to do to address that and it was like all right well like you know we're on this end of the spectrum. We're getting attacked three to four times a day. We can't, you know, can't even operate effectively because of this. What can we do to change and turn the tide of this situation so that we can get some breathing room and then try to actually help maybe revive the economy or link political governance, right? Which is the other two lines of effort, but it's like, Hey, if security is not there, we're not going to be able to build a school, yeah. right? If there's IEDs in every single building and, you know, we can't go anywhere. So, so in lieu of that, what we decided to do is like, hey, we can go out and find these guys or, or ambush them or kill them before they kill us. And if we do that enough, they'll back off a little bit or they'll stop being as brazen or, uh, you know, it'll influence the situation in a certain way. And so what we would do is we'd start to conduct these patrols um, and it wasn't surgical strikes. It wasn't, you know, removing people of the battlefield and capturing them and bringing them back. It was, we're going to go hunt down people and kill them as they're coming to attack us, right? Before they can do it, right? And so how can we outsmart them? How can we maneuver, outmaneuver them and set the conditions to do that uh, and be in control, right? And, and establish a buffer um, because we're in this small site with just a small number of Americans and our Afghan partners kind of out in the middle of nowhere on our own, right? And, uh, and so that was the, the decision we made at that time. Were, were you having to bait people to come out no, in some way, no, they were just coming out no matter what. Yeah, and, and it was a trick. So it started when, it when we first started. It was a lot, right? There was like three to four times a day, and then after a few of these missions, then they're like, "Oh, different situation. These guys are now proactively doing this. Um, maybe we won't send as many people to go do this, or maybe we'll change. Yeah. Like maybe we'll try to change things." And so what happened was they would send. You know, they, they had an endless supply of young people being ordered to go and try to shoot at Americans, even if they knew they were going to die um, because that was a situation in the Helmand province. And so what they would do is, you know, every day they'd send another guy, right? Like send one guy, go, Hey, go try to shoot, shoot at the base here. Go try to do this. Go try to, you know, shoot a, a UGL an underbarrel grenade launch around in the compound here, like sneak through this riverbed to get, get close to them. And, and, and so we, 
we could kind of see and we could map it out based on terrain, right? And it was almost like World War II or World War One or like Vietnam, right? So I say that based on the terrain wise because we're in this kind of uh, farmland, which is kind of rolling, undulating terrain with canals crisscrossing the area, very green, very lush with kind of like tall trees. So like a lot of places where people can hide. Um, and so it's really just kind of this game of cat and mouse, right? Of like, how do we find them before they find us? Um, there's only so many areas where they can come to get to us. It's, it wasn't rocket science, right? And especially with like the team I had who had tons of experience fighting in this area, these types of missions, understanding the enemy better than, you know, like I ever could have. Um, they were good. They were really good, like very successful at doing that and accomplishing that. Can you kind of talk through what one of those ops would look like or those missions? Like yeah. getting out yeah. and, and setting up in a position or however you do it, movement. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of prioritize the threat and, uh, and when we assess the holistic picture, um, we were trying to mitigate threats while still accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. The biggest threat to us at that time was IEDs improvised explosive devices. Um, and so they'd put these things everywhere. Like if there's an abandoned building, there's probably 20 of them in there. There's one in the doorway. There's one in there, there's like random where I'd like middle of nowhere, middle of the farm field, like just everywhere because this area of the Hellman province, they call it the green zone. It's one of the only or the most fertile farming area in the Hellman province. And so they use it for growing crops. And in this time they were growing poppy because that was what was the most valuable to them. And so they were unwilling to just, give this up without a fight. Right. And so, um, and we weren't either, right. This is why we were there, right. We were trying to fight to help get rid of the Taliban, right. Who were, you know, growing poppy and, you know, trading heroin. And so, um, so uh, they had put IEDs everywhere, like literally everywhere. Um, And the TTP for them was, Hey, we're not going to fight you conventionally. Just, squad on squad, you know, direct fire weapons, rifles, that kind of thing. It's like, Hey, we're going to put an IED every single spot that you could potentially walk or drive. And then we're going to put somebody out there and they may be, you know, six to 10 feet back in the, in the, in a room, in a dark room. So you can't see them. And, uh, they're going to shoot at you when you walk out on patrol and they're probably not going to hit you. Right. But we understand your battle drills where you're going to seek cover. Right. And so once you get to a certain point, then we're going to open fire, hoping that your team then seeks cover at the nearest fence or tree line or whatever else. And that's where one to five or 10 IEDs are. Right. And then you blow up and yeah. And so knowing that it changed our TTPs a lot. Um, And so to counteract the threat, if you're in that situation during the daytime, the only things you can really do is either just stop and not seek cover and try to return fire, but with no cover, right. And still being getting shot at, um, which is kind of a bad situation. Uh, and inevitably over time, that's going to cause you to rush, right. And to make hasty decisions, um, with respect to the IED threat. And so for us, what we chose to do long story short, we would go out at night because they couldn't see us or try to drive. They, you know, they didn't have effective night vision capability at that time. Um, they couldn't see us and that allowed us a lot of time to slowly and methodically work our way to anywhere we wanted to go. So we'd only move at night um, using EOD techs, dogs, all the assets that we had at our disposal. So we'd identify a place where like, okay, we're going to go set up at this place, a click and a half, this building, this compound, a click and a half to the Southwest. Here's how we're going to get there. We'll plan a mission and go out there uh, tomorrow night. Once we got in the compound, we'd stay there all day, come back the following night. So we'd basically stay out for about 24 hours because we didn't want to move anywhere during the daytime. Um, we'd stay there, observe for activity, fight from a from a fortified position, um, you know, because we'd be able to set up and hang out there uh, behind, you know, thick walls, which can provide cover and concealment and all these sorts of things. Um, and then we're not on the move, right? We're just kind of hanging, watching. We're, we're in a position where we can affect the battle and fight that way. And so that was kind of the, the TTPs that we had at that time um, and how we were able to, to do that. And it was, it was pretty successful for us. Um, You know, one of the things I am proud of is too, is like uh, 
during that entire deployment, no Americans were blown up, right? We had nobody get hit by an IED. That's remarkable. Um, after seven months, right? And so, you know, the, we were very cautious and methodical about that. Um, and so uh, I was obviously had plenty of other challenges and threats as well, but that was, you know, how we kind of handled that one. And then if we can jump to what I would imagine is the life-changing moment for you and what that operation was like, yeah. if you could talk us through that. For sure. Yeah. So uh, it was June 14th, 2012. Uh, we followed that exact playbook for us, which was identify a compound, go out, set up. Um, and this one, it was a little bit further than we'd ever been. So it was maybe, I don't know, a click and a half from a, 1.5 kilometers from our base. Uh, we got set up at night. It was fine. And it was also, we were also going out there to kind of do uh, a coordinated operation with the Green Beret team to our south. So they were kind of, they they didn't operate at night. They operated during the day and they, they had a different style of operations, but they were like, hey, we're going to start cruising up during the day and we're likely going to scare up some fighters. So this is what we're doing. We're like, oh, well, that's cool. Like, hey, if you're going to scare them up, why don't we just set a position, kind of set a blocking position where we are, and then we can work together to, you know, mitigate any threats that, that come our way. Uh, so we got in there. Um, and then, you know, shortly after sunrise, they step off and have some issues and find some, some bad guys. Uh, and we find ourselves in kind of a firefight. Uh, and that uh, escalated pretty quickly. Um, so about, I think, 7 a.m. Uh, after we'd kind of made an initial engagement and, you know, enemy was aware of our position, there were a lot of fighters that started to come and, and uh, attack us. Uh, and kind of in between some of those moments, the firefight, uh, we were in these compounds, right? And it's uh, mud, brick, basically compounds. There's a house. And I say a compound, it's a house with a giant mud wall around it. Um, and so if you're inside the compound, you're protected and you can't see anything. But, you know, if you want to be able to see something, you have to get up on the roof. And so we'd usually position people on the rooftop. But if you're on the roof, you could also be shot and injured or, you know. Uh, so it's this battle. It's kind of this, this fine line of cover and concealment uh, while also maintaining situational awareness. And so uh, initially I had my assistant patrol leader, uh, one of my gunnery sergeants, Brian Jacklin, uh, who was on the rooftop with two other Marines. Um, and then we switched out because I wanted to be able to see what was going on. So I was up there for a few minutes. And then shortly after I'd gotten up there, uh, I was engaged by a fighter who had shot uh, the Marine to my left and then also uh, shot me. Uh, and so the bullet went into my shoulder and lodged in my spine. I was paralyzed from the chest down. And so I kind of slumped over, tried to triage myself, realized nothing below my uh, chest was working. I felt the pain. So I got on the radio immediately and notified the team I'd been hit and that Ricky, my sergeant to the left, who'd been hit. Um, the third Marine was able to roll off the roof, but uh, that kind of kicked off their coordinated assault from multiple directions, multiple fighters, um, and kind of started this, this you know engagement back up. Um, and so we had about 10 Americans and 10 Afghans in this compound. Uh, and so now two of which are mortally wounded or critically injured. Um, the other eight Americans, you know, coming together to spring into action to, to try to get us off the roof, triage us, return fire, repel the enemy, call on a medical evacuation helicopter, doing all these things. Uh, and they're able to successfully pull it together and do it and get us out of there. And so myself, I, you know, lived uh and recovered um ricky was actually shot through the neck he has actually made a full recovery um, wow it's pretty incredible uh so literally in one side not the other and nowadays you'd never if you saw him you'd never guess he was even injured right you'd be like you were shot through the neck it's like yeah um but we we're able to do that because uh because of the heroism and bravery and selflessness displayed by the team and so uh, you know, for me, it was a pretty tough day. Uh, you know, what I like to call the best and worst day of my life. And so, uh, you know, it was the worst day of my life because, you know, I was injured, uh, paralyzed from the chest down, which I'm still paralyzed this to this day, right. With no control or function below my level of injury. Um, worst day of my life because, uh, I can no longer be a special operator. I can no longer, you know, be a Marine. Um, you know, devoted to the profession that profession that I'd, I'd given my life to, to that point and wanted to stay in for as long as I could, cause I was having, you know, so much fun and, and doing what I wanted to be doing with the people I wanted to do it with. Um, 
but it was also the best day of my life because as a leader, uh, you know, it's all selflessness, bravery and heroism that I think is unmatched, right? Period. Uh, watching the team that I was fortunate to be a part of come together and, and operate in a capacity in that manner and, and rally to save our lives and, and to, to get us out of there. Um, is something that, you know, I'll never forget. It's the only reason I'm here today because while under enemy fire, you know, they were still able to call in a medevac and we actually have video and, and, and images of this too, but they have to leave the safety of that compound to carry us to the helicopter. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do, especially when, you know, you have two 300 pound guys in a poleless litter that you have to carry over uneven terrain with your kid on. And so because of that, the second you step out of there, you're exposed and you also can't return fire. And so without hesitation to a man, the other eight guys and the Afghan partners all, all helped and uh, you know, we're willing to risk their lives to save ours. And so um, that's why I'm here today. How long do you think it was from the time you and Ricky get hit until you're on the aircraft and flying? It was a tough situation. It took a while. So it's probably about 30 minutes, I think. Um, And so Murphy's law, right. As, as soon as that happened, um, our comms went down. I think our antenna rolled off the roof as well from SATCOM. No way. So, uh, So luckily my assistant patrol leader, Brian Jacklin is one of the most experienced Marine special operators to, to have lived, right? Like period. Uh, he had, had multi, a, a lot of our, a lot of our team members, uh, on that mission today had had multiple deployments as operators to Helmand province. And so, uh, they knew what to do and were able to overcome that. And so Brian got on the sat phone, called him the syrup, got the helicopters moving. He had our JTAC start, you know, dropping buildings, giving us some breathing room, uh, reestablished calm. Our medic brought us back, brought, you know, stopped the, was able to use a uh, cell ox to, to stop the bleeding for Rick's neck, which obviously you can't put a tourniquet on, you know? And so he actually like woke up and was like awake before he got on the helicopter. Um, and I was taking a turn for the worse actually, because I had, you know, sort of had blood pooling in my chest cavity, compressing my lung and doing all this stuff. Um, but the level of, you know, training and uh, experience that the team had, you know, was, was really, I think the deciding factor that, that enabled them to be successful during that yeah. day. Damn. So a few of the, the operators I've talked to have said, you know, one of the hardest things mentally to overcome is the potential loss of limb, basically like dying is one thing, but the idea of having to live in, in this other reality is, is even harder as a pilot. I've never had to experience it. Like I think if we get hit, the idea is you're going to disintegrate in the ground. Like you're either going to die or you're not going to lose something like that. How, like the moments after this is happening, what's going through your head beyond just the fact that you have to like keep the team safe and transition. I'm assuming like control of the battle to set to your, to your uh, assistant patrol leader. Yeah. So in the, in the immediate aftermath, you know, I was just trying to help out however I could. Right. So like uh, relaying information, to the team, talking through medical procedure, like anything I could. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, it was kind of interesting because I, I don't really know how to explain it other than people have who've been through it can kind of understand. But you have these like wave of emotions with you know fear and uncertainty to uh, joy and elation. Like I'm still alive, right? Like I still, you know yeah, I'm paralyzed, but I'm still alive. Right. And like, you know, so I woke up and, uh, in Bastion at the the hospital there and talked to someone and the doctor's like, Hey, you're paralyzed. You may never walk in. I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, did I call my wife? And he's like, no. And I'm like, okay, my <laughs> phone, right. Like, what are you doing standing here, sir? Like, uh, and so then I had to call my wife. Right. But, you know, fortunately, uh, I was able to make the call. Right. And, uh, it could have been a lot worse. And so, you know, so I was doing that. And then also thinking about that too, is like, uh, there is not a lot I can do for my team right now. Um, the only thing I can do is not squander the opportunity that I have to live. And so, you know, they're still there for another six months 
afterwards, right? Where I don't have any say in whether they come home alive or not, right? And so up until that point in my life, everything had been about the team. And as a Marine, you're always together. You're always in the unit. You're always doing things. And that's your mission, right? And so my job was to lead these guys through this deployment. And now I'm off in a hospital by myself, you know, just hanging out, right? Uh, and so the two options, right? Like feel sorry for myself and, you know, that's going to be, you know, pretty bad for their morale or like, you know, take advantage of every day that I have and, and move forward and try to figure this out. Right. Um, and so that was the way I thought about it. I also had like interesting and unique experience. So the guy that I told you about before my company XO, um, who was there when I checked into the first Marine Raider battalion, he lost both his legs in Afghanistan in 2010. And he deployed with us back to Afghanistan in 2012. So my company XO when we deployed was a bilateral amputee above the knee. Uh, and so, you know, for me, as I come back, like, I'm like, yeah, I'll be fine. Right. Like, wow. My friend, Matt, like he was, he didn't miss a cycle. Right. He was back deploying in Afghanistan two years as a Marine special operator on, amp on prosthetic legs. Right. So I'm like, he just did that. So like, who knows, like, wh wh what can I do? Right. So I, I had, I was very fortunate to have a lot of uh, things to think about that, that, you know, uh, allowed me to stay positive moving forward for, yeah. for a period of time. And I, I think I read that you go back into like a, an ops shop before you medically retire out. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened was I came back to Bethesda and then went to Tampa to the VA because I had a spinal cord injury and I didn't, I didn't know anything about spinal cord injury. Um, it's, you know, they, they kind of tell you when you first get injured, uh, everyone is different. You may recover. You may not. We don't really know. There's no pills, you know, like there, there's not, there's no real treatments or therapies. It's like, Hey, you may recover. You may not. Um, which is good and bad because it leaves you the opportunity to think positively. And you're like, Hey, I'm going to get up out of here and walk out of here in six weeks. But then yeah. when you don't, you know, at a certain point you're like, well, maybe I'm not going to get up. Maybe I, maybe I never will walk again. Right. And so now what? Um, and so coming to grips with some of that is always tough. And so I was at Tampa and I, I also thought there would be like these new, I didn't know much about the medical system. So I thought, oh, I'm going to the world leading center for spinal cord injury excellence. And, uh, they're going to have all these new breakthrough therapies and stuff. And they're, they're not the world leading center for experimental research. They're the world leading center for just like stabilizing people and keeping them alive. And so like, okay, well, once I'm out of the hospital, I'm stabilized. What do you guys have to offer? And they're like, well, you know, you can lift weights and you can do this stuff. I'm like, cool. Uh, that's it. Right. And like, I can do that in California. I don't need to be here and uproot and be in Tampa at a spinal cord injury center for this. Like I want to get out of the freaking hospital. I'm going to get home and, uh, and go back to work. Right. And so good or bad, my choice was to, to try to recover by being helpful and valuable to the same community and the same people that I cared about before. And my chain of command was awesome. They were super supportive about anything. And I was very fortunate because, you know, our building was new and it was one of the only wheelchair accessible building, you know, it was a brand new building, uh, you know, it was like had an elevator in it. Right. Like, so like all of these things that I was very fortunate to have that a lot of people don't in the military. Um, and so they were like, Hey, yeah, we need a assistant operations officer. Right. And you can go do plans and policy, whatever, whatever, right. Like whatever you want to do. Um, I was like, cool. And so going back to the unit, that was more healing than like, any sort of physical therapy I could have ever have done. And wow. I also, I mean, we also had physical therapists at like, because of the SOCOM community at that time, we have full-time physical therapists. We have full-time, you know, psychology, we have everything internally because of the resources that SOCOM has brought to bear for these units. And so, uh, so it was very fortunate. Couldn't have had a better place to, to, to work and, and move forward. Why do you then decide to transition out? Uh, at that point, wanted to pursue something else. So the, the job, so the program for the Marine Corps was called expanded permanent limited duty. And so there was temporary limited duty and expanded permanent limited duty. And so you could say, I could have chosen to stay in the Marine Corps forever, but after one or two years, if I wanted to stay in, I would have had to retrain in an MOS that I could do. Uh, and that would have been like admin supply logistics, something non-deployable, right? Like those sorts of things. And I was like, I love the Marine Corps, but 
that's not me, man. I didn't sign up to be, you know, to do this. And even though that's an important role in supporting or whatever else, like I found this other thing that I want to do and, and I'm ready to go. And like, this is it. And so at that time, about a year, maybe not even a year after I'd been injured, I went back to business school part-time in the executive MBA program at UCLA. Um, and so, uh, you know, while I was sitting in the hospital, <laughs> like, it's like, Oh, what am I going to do with my life? Uh, maybe I'll go back to school. So start applying to schools, like, you know, a month after my injury or whatever. And, um, found this program, which is awesome. Uh, and then while I was there kind of came to this realization that, um, a lot of things I can do in life, right. I can do whatever I can, I can find a job, right. I can go forward and do that. Uh, I'm still fortunate to have, you know, my mental faculties, you know, having any brain injury, like I, I, I can still contribute in a meaningful way. Um, but is there something that I'm uniquely qualified to do? Is there something that only I can do? Right. Uh, and what I found was I had this idea that as I was trying to become an expert in spinal cord injury overnight and recover, uh, I realized there's a lot of unmet needs. And so I understand this problem firsthand. Uh, and then with a background in engineering and entrepreneurship, um, you know, I could create solutions to try to solve these problems and build businesses and corporations to do that. And so that was my hypothesis at that time. And that's what I spent the past seven years or so doing and building is, is trying to build medical technologies and medical devices that can help improve people's lives um, with conditions that I understand firsthand. And, and so I just want to make sure I get the names right. One is Eurodev Medical. The other is Habit Camera. Is that right? Yeah. Can you just yeah. share, uh, I mean, I'm personally just really interested in, in this and how yeah. you, how you went from, you know, being a soldier, a Marine, an officer into running a couple businesses. Yeah. So I had this idea and, uh, had another experience too, where when things become relatable or you see other people accomplish things that are similar, then it doesn't seem so impossible. Yeah. And so I'd gotten involved with another company that uh, is called Rewalk Robotics. And they make an exoskeleton device that enables people to stand and walk who are paralyzed. And so this is the only way I could stand and walk. And then I was using this technology when I retired from the military, I was able to do this without a wheelchair, right? Despite the entire retirement ceremony, the whole thing, um, which for me was a, a really important event in my life. But I was also able to meet the founder and the founder of that company is a guy who's paralyzed. And he just like had an idea and started working on it in his garage and eventually over time with enough time and resources and, and, and passion, a company is now created that's commercializing this technology to help people across the world, right? Hundreds of people, thousands of people across the world uh, doing something that they thought they could never do again. Right. And so now when I meet this guy, I'm like, he's no different than me, right? He's passionate. He's smart, hardworking, understands a problem and trying to develop a solution. Like I can do all of that. Right. So like, why don't I go do that? Because uh, there's these other aspects of, of being paralyzed that suck that are just absolutely terrible. And so the biggest one for me was bladder management, which was terrible, right? And and still is. And so that's what I've been working on for the past, you know, better part of seven years with Eurodev Medical is uh, creating a device that enables people, adult men primarily right now, uh, to regain control of bladder emptying and, and, and urinating, right? And so one of the problems with being paralyzed is, you know, you can't, control your bladder. So in most cases, the best thing they can do for you is say, okay, well, we'll try to make your bladder just stable enough so that it holds a little bit. So you aren't, you know, incontinent or leaking all the time. Um, but every time you go to the bathroom, you're going to pull out this small plastic tube called a catheter, insert it into your penis up until it reaches the bladder, draining the bladder, and then you're going to throw it away. And so every time you go to the bathroom, you do that right? You pull out a new one, you do it. It's disposable. You do it. Right. And that helps with like cleanliness and all that stuff. But at the same time, you know, I was 28 years old when I got injured. I'm like, I'm doing this eight to 10 times a day. This is going to be tens, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times by the time I die. Right. Like there has to be a better way. And sure enough, you know, I ask enough people and they're like, no, no, it's fine. That's, that's actually pretty good. I'm like, yeah, you say that you're not the guy who has to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling yeah. you this sucks, right? This is terrible. And, uh, and a lot of people feel the way I do. And so um, kind of became obsessed with solving this problem, which uh, laid the foundation over the time that I was in business school 
I, I took a job part-time at another startup to get experience. And then when I graduated, just went for it and just started the company and pursued it full time. And it took a long time before we ever raised a dime or figured out how to make it work or anything else. But um, over the past you know, six years, we've gone to the point where we have a napkin sketch, uh, which is now a medical device that's on the cusp of FDA clearance. And so hopefully we'll be cleared and selling this product to help men everywhere, you know, wow. in the US and potentially across the world eventually um, regain control of their bladder. And what, what it does, the device we designed is, yeah. is a catheter. It's a smart catheter, but it's fully internal to the body. So it's a device can be easily inserted or removed stay in the body for at least seven days uh, or up to seven days. And then can be remotely operated. So you can just push a button and empty your bladder. Uh, and so instead of sticking, you know, a new catheter in your body, every time you have to go to the bathroom, you basically have this device in your body that, you know, you can just control. And so it's more natural. It's more like urinate, you know, and uh, you know, and so just like before where I thought I'd never walk again until some other guy who was paralyzed created an invention and worked hard to create, make it real. And now I can walk again because of that technology. In my mind, the mission I'm on is all the people who thought they'd never pee again, like now with new technology, they can pee again, right? Like this is urinate. This is just like yeah. controlled urination, right? And that's, 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 that's what we've been working on. And so, uh, so that's your dev medical. And then, um, now that that company's more mature, I've hired a CEO and I've implemented a transition plan and have uh, you know, been doing less and less with that company. I'm still consulting and working, you know, to support them. But, uh, the CEO that I've hired is tons of experience, way more experience. I mean, is the right guy to take it to the next level. Um, and, uh, and we'll take it to the next level. Uh, and now I've kind of started to try to solve other problems. Right. And so the habit camera is a, a very simple device. I didn't invent it. I just licensed the technology and the intellectual property from the VA. And, um, that device is a very simple device for, for skin inspection. And so for people in wheelchairs, it's a big issue because you can get crusher sores or ulcers mm -hmm. and the treatment for that is, is pretty terrible. So um, if you have a surgery or one of these like issues, it's potentially deadly. Um, and the therapy for it is basically you'll have to uh, sit in a bed, you know, you'd be bedridden for like six months after the surgery, right? Like Forrest Gump style, like you can't turn over, right? Um, or for diabetics, you know, uh, if you have a diabetic foot ulcer that gets bad, they're going to amputate your foot, right? They're going to amputate your toe. They're going to amputate, uh, something. And, uh, and so this device is just a simple low cost way to inspect your skin. Uh, and then it's digital. So it also enables telehealth and you can share it with, you know, your clinicians or caregivers or, or anybody like that. And so, um, it's that product we're, we're excited about getting on the market hopefully soon too. God, you're making me feel like shit, man. <laughs> That's awesome. You're, I mean, I'm really so cool. You're scratching your own itch, so to speak, but bringing people together. And man, can we just talk briefly about the Marine Raider Foundation? I know you're on the board there and some other places. Yeah. Um, what's what, what's going on with you in that capacity? How the hell do you have enough time yeah. to do this? And what's going on there? Yeah. So um, Marine Raider Foundation is kind of like, Navy SEAL Foundation, Green Beret Foundation, but just for the Marine Raider community. And so what we do is we we raise funds to support the Marine Raider community with uh, unmet needs from the government. And so um, anybody who's been injured or families of the fallen, uh, anytime they have financial needs or need support, we're there to help them uh, and remove a lot of stress from their plate. And so I was fortunate to be able to, to have received support from the organization when I was injured because uh, it's a newer organization. Um, and so they helped me raise money to buy the exoskeleton because that was not covered by insurance. It's so the, you know, when I came to them and said, Hey, there's this thing, like, I want to be able to walk again. If I get it, I can do it. They're like, we can help you do that. And because of that, you know, that was a life-changing event for me, right? Because that injection of support financially, you know, which I couldn't have afforded the exoskeleton otherwise, uh, uh, enabled me to, to have these experiences and remove you know, significant stress for my life. Um, and so, uh, so after I left active duty, the organization, you know, they said, Hey, do you want to be a board member? I was like, absolutely. Like I will do anything to help give back to this organization. Cause you know, they've helped me in so many ways that I can never repay. Um, and then shortly after that I became the president of the board and, um, I've tried to help out there. And so, uh, we have a good, great team. Uh, and so they do the work. We actually have employees that do all the, the real work. Um, and unfortunately just to be the cheerleader and try to help, uh, you know, Attitude. serve up a board yeah. and 
and, and, and everything else and tell people about what we're doing. And so, um, so yeah, so very fortunate to, to do that. Damn. So I'm, I'm going to get you out of here in a sec. I just got a couple more questions, but there's one that's come to mind for, for you in particular, as honestly as you can answer this. And I know it's hard because you're CEO, you're on a board, but how the hell do you interact with people? And I'm sure you hear people, certainly employees or just others who complain about the lives that they have when, when like eight to time, 10, eight to 10 times a day, you're talking about having this like horrible experience to just go to the bathroom, right? Like mentally, how, how do you overcome that? Yeah. Uh, for me, it doesn't like, it still sucks every time I do it, but I, I like, I, I temper that because every day, you know, I have an opportunity to change it. Right. We're getting closer and closer to changing that. And so that's, that doesn't bother me, but, but it is funny you say that though, because like, uh, as like, I'm, you know, meeting new people and everything else, like, uh, most of them have the self-awareness that they just feel bad complaining around me and whether that's good or bad, like they just, I want to be a guy who like, you should be open to and feel able like you complain like you know um and so i try to go out of my way to make people feel comfortable about that yeah. but at the same time a lot of times you know like uh you know a lot of people are like they they kind of self-censor i guess where they're like oh man i just had a terrible day at work but uh you know, like, <laughs> tell me about it like i want to hear about my you know? latte was too hot you know, yeah, you know? uh <laughs> or you know like yeah like some of that stuff so um so i, I try to be sense of that because because the other thing i've learned too uh like totally random side story is the body processes these emotions the same way regardless of the type of threat or or duress that you're under so financial stress can be as debilitating or as crippling as survival stress like Cause you feel like you're going to die, right? Like you're going, if you're going through bankruptcy or you're going to get foreclosed on it, like that can drive you to do, like it can make you do things. It can phys- it can cause physical reactions in your body. And that happened to me after I started this company. And so my wife loves telling this story. Interesting. And, uh, I started a company, first company, first time entrepreneur trying to raise money as a CEO investment. I just hired a couple of employees. Uh, we're trying to make payroll, doing all these things. The first, I'd hire a few employees and, you know, they were like single, young college guys. I wasn't as worried, but then I hired an employee who had a wife and three kids and a mortgage. And, you know, and then I was like thinking to myself, just like, just like this weight where it's like, if I'm not successful at my job, like it's not just this guy who's not going to get the money. It's like his, like his family is, he was relying on this money that I need to bring in for this company to operate based on this vision and this idea that I created. Right. So like, if I can't deliver I'm going to feel pretty terrible about that. And then there was also other stress with financing and fundraising. Long story short, I had this migraine on the side of my head for like three days, right? And finally I go to the ER and they're like, well, no, ruled out this, ruled out that, ruled out that. And then they find some red bump and they're like, are you under a lot of stress? And I'm like, maybe, yeah, I just had twins, you know, financial stress, whatever. And they're like, well, you have stress-induced shingles. And that's normal if you're 65 or older, but you're 32. Uh, no way. You probably not get under stress. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and so the funny thing is my wife loves telling the story. Cause she's like, you went to combat, you got shot, fight it for your life. Didn't give you shingles, but you start a business and you have twins and all of a sudden you're in the ER, right? Like you are like manifesting that stress in that way that like your body is shutting down, right. Or causing these adverse reactions. And so, um, and so because of that, like I learned, right. Like how you, you cannot compare, I, you should not, I, I don't think you should compare experiences to anyone else's, right? Because even, you know, it's just different. There, there's, they, 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 there's always somebody out there who's had a, a tougher road. There's always other people out there that have easier roads, but think they were tougher and like, it's valid. To, that's, that's their reality. That's, that's their thing. It's valid. So um, all I can do is try to be a good person and listen or try to help out or, you know, help solve problems where, where I can. Well, presumably the employees and their mortgages didn't go away, but you seem to be in a better spot. Like, did you take any specific steps to get to this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now, especially now, like I know 
I know more. I, don't, I won't say that I know what I'm doing, but I know more of what I'm doing, right? <laughs> like as a first time entrepreneur, you're kind of figuring yeah. it out and you're in this like stressful situation. It's like, it can be re- like, you know, it's daunting, right? Um, but uh, now that I've had a repetition and kind of a, a couple of repetitions, like, you know, I feel more confident in my abilities to accomplish the missions that I set out on. I'm also smarter about, you know, a, a lot of different aspects of, of what I'm trying to pursue. Um, yeah. It's just like everything, like with more experience and more proficiency, you should feel more confident and less stress, right? Like the first time you do anything, right? It's like, it's probably like the first time you flew a plane, right? Like it's probably very stressful, right? And you're like, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden you can do it in your sleep, you know? So not in your sleep, but you can do it very easily. Yeah. True. Okay. So two, two questions just to wrap up here, Derek, uh, sure. two that I ask everybody. So the first is, was there anything that you carried with you into combat that had sentimental value somebody had given you that was important to you or a good luck charm of that sort? Uh, there were a few things. Um, the, uh, we had uh, Raider patches when I was in the unit. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a pretty important thing for us to have. Uh, and at that time we actually weren't called Raiders. So we weren't officially allowed to be called Marine Raiders until 2015, I think after I had just left the service. Um, and so we were just Marines. Right. Uh, and then luckily Admiral McRaven finally convinced the Marine Corps to let us have a name. Um, but they fought it all the way for years and years and years, but there was this underground insurgency. There was this, this guerrilla movement of like, <laughs> Marine Raiders is what we're going to be is what we're going to do. These are, you know, this is our lineage. This is who we are. And Marine Raiders was the special operations Marines in world war II, um, that was disbanded after, you know, after they got back and after the war was over. Um, and so we'd wear the Raider patch. The other one that I did bring not into combat operations, but not into battle uh, was a journal. So I brought a journal on every deployment I have been on. Um, and, uh, and, and those were two things that, you know, I brought everywhere. Did, did you write in the journal like when you came to after the injury? No, uh, because I didn't have it. So I, I, I didn't have it on me. It was in my okay. you know, yeah, of course. In the base. Yeah. And then it was actually probably like a month or two because the guys had to pack up my stuff and ship it back and whatever else. But I have those now. And like looking back on, I'm like, there, a lot of stuff happened that I, I forgot. Right. And so actually just the other day, I was just reading through it. And I was like, man, I totally forgot. Like that was a really interesting day. Right. Um, you know, and so those, those are things that I'll cherish for a long time. Yeah. I, I regret not keeping one. And I, I can only imagine if you went back and you're, you're like, so a lot's happened in the past month here. Let me, let me update you on, on my life now. Oh, that's crazy. Okay. So last question, yeah. um, looking back on, on this time, you've suffered more than most, I would say, um, would you go back and do that experience again, the military, the Marine Corps, all of that again? Yeah, no question. Yeah. I, I, I talk a lot of people about this. I, I've tried to mentor, you know, people considering joining the military and everything else. And, um, uh, it's different now, right? The military is different now, but, um, at the end of the day, the way I try to frame this is, uh, there's a cost to, uh, to obtain things, right? Whether it's a product or an experience or lifestyle or profession, like there is a cost associated with, any line of work you want to go into, any school you want to get into, uh, the best thing you can do is educate yourself on what, uh, what, you know, the costs are of obtaining what you want to achieve. And as long as you know that going in, then go for it. Right. And I don't say physical costs, like injury, I'm talking about like, you know, a lot of the other stuff, uh, that you have to do. Right. So like when you, when you sign up to go in, like if I want to be a Marine or a special operator, like I have to be willing to, you know, move every three years or have to be willing to, you know, like all, all the stuff you have to do in order to achieve that goal or that title or that profession, like, uh, it has a cost and you just have to know what the costs are and, and do that. And so like I was talking to a young, you know, uh, call it, re- you know, future uh, he's a college kid who's about to graduate and wants to be a Marine officer or anything else. And so I just been explaining to him all that. And, you know, uh, and for me, I wouldn't change anything, right? Like, you know, the experiences I've had to date, all the things I've learned, all the people I've met, um, irreplaceable, right? Like, and, uh, and, and invaluable. Um, and, you know, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't imagine, uh, my life any better than it is now. Man. God. 
Well, I'm, I'm so appreciative of the time. I wish you so much luck with, with these technologies you're building out that are actually going to help people who really need it. So thanks for spending the time with us and sharing, Derek. It's uh, been a lot of fun, man. Thank you. Pleasure's all mine and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and chat. So thank you so much, Ryan. Our first comment is an Apple five-star review from b Dues. And it says, as an ex-Marine turned truck driver, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing this podcast week in, week out. I've searched long and hard for any and all military-related podcasts to listen to to get me through parts of the day on the road. This is by far the greatest military podcast out there. So easy to listen to and so personal. It's great to hear how others conquer their combat struggles and how they move forward from them, as well as their success post-military career. Thank you again, Ryan, for being such a great interviewer and for the amazing show, Semper Fi. Thanks so much for leaving that. It uh, means a ton to hear that from you. I know there's a lot of other podcasts out there and truthfully, we're not competing. Um, it's all just telling stories and, and there's nothing but abundance. But I really do appreciate that you find ours and find the time to listen to it. And I also pull some of the same lessons and meanings out that, uh, that you're talking about here, how people have overcome some of their struggles and filled the gap or the void that they have when they leave the service. So um, for you in particular, please stay safe as you're out there on the road. And uh, thank you for taking the time to leave this. Our second comment comes from another YouTube listener, Chris Amos 412, and it's on the Eric Brethen interview, who many of you will recall was a 19 year old warrant officer in Vietnam flying single pilot loaches in some incredibly intense combat scenarios. And he says, it was an honor and pleasure to hear Eric's combat experiences. I appreciate your service to our country. Thank you, Ryan, for interviewing Eric. You make it look easy. It's a real joy to watch. Man, uh, that means a ton to me. Eric is a uh, friend of my father-in-law's and um, never would have found him without my father-in-law connecting us. But I think when you've heard what he went through and some of the antics, it's part of the reason you love the fact that you can go high school to flight school be a 19 year old out there in combat because you need somebody who who doesn't mind mixing it up and getting crazy and eric was one of those guys so it's really cool to hear his stories uh, years later thanks for taking the time to leave that chris stay safe y'all